Welcome back, everybody. It's undercarriage time. We've got both 1113's assemblies ready for disassembly. Now, in 1938, of course, this is first generation, as we've said many, many times, this was high tech right here, this whole undercarriage design. It was compact, it was clean, it was convenient, mostly for the reason that they put this gigantic recoil spring on the center line of the track frame. Before 1938, before the D2s, you know, you're talking about the Forerunner Model 22 and then the, I think, the early 5E Series R2s that the D2 eventually replaced. They did not have a single big center recoil spring pushing on that idler. They had two externally mounted recoil springs on the outside of the track frame. To show you what I'm talking about, we'll go to the Caterpillar and equipment chart here. You can see the Cat 10, the recoil spring outside of the track frame. 15 as well, the Cat 20, same design. They did do a pretty good job of putting some covers over those, but it still was a heck of a bump out and made it wider. Caterpillar 30. Caterpillar 60 all followed the same suit. Now the trouble with those externally mounted springs was, well, first off, they were externally mounted. So it made the track frame wider and they stuck out where they could get damaged if you ran something into them. And it also made tensioning the track a little bit more involved because you had an adjustment point for the spring on the outside to advance the idler, as well as a second adjustment point for a second spring on the inside. And you had to adjust both of those equally so that you ran the idler out straight. If you went one side further than the other, it would cock it sideways. It would cause accelerated wear on your track chain, on your idler. So this design right here was just a vast improvement over all of that. Centrally mounted, big old recoil spring. They could cover it with a dirt guard. It was protected and you only had one adjustment point. Here is your adjuster nut right here and the yoke that goes forward to the idler actually has pinch bolts that go through the two halves so once you reach your desired track tension you tighten both these bolts down that pinches on the adjuster nut locks the assembly or locks the adjustment i should say right in place but it did bring with it a new unforeseen problem to explain, I've got this already disassembled recoil spring assembly here on the floor. So, of course, you have the spring right there. It wants to roll away on me. You have this end plate at the back, which you can see right here. You have this long bolt, okay, that goes all the way up the middle, and you can see it sticking out the front. It's also what the idler adjustment, track adjustment nut threads onto. This bolt goes into the back plate like that. It's got a square head on the end and the design or the shape inside of here cages that square head, keeps that bolt from turning. But because it's so deep, that bolt can drift forward and back a couple inches in that end plate. And you have the front plate, and then you have the nut, which you can see there and there, which tensions this whole spring. You set these up to an assembled length of 17 and 1 16th inches from the flat machine face at the back to the flat machine face at the front. That adequately preloads the spring assembly to absorb any kind of shock loads or additional track loads that can occur during operation. The way that works, if an object was to get picked up and get in between the track and an idler or between the track and a sprocket, the spring is able to compress to allow that object to roll around and eventually pass back out. What that does, it keeps excessive loads off of the idler, off of the final drive, off of the rollers, off the frame. It's just a really, it's a, it's a genius system really. So once that, you know, obstruction finally clears the track, the spring decompresses, it resets the front idler to the previous uh, track tension adjustment. Everything's well and good. I mentioned you pre-assemble these to 17 and 1 16th inches on the D2. Well, we'll go to the Selected Service Articles book. They have a pretty good paragraph in here about recoil springs, and it says, to assist in the assembly of recoil springs, the lengths and loads of the springs are given. The measurements are taken from the machine faces of the end coils. Since they are heavily loaded when compressed to the assembled lengths given below, care should be used in handling them. So we have, first off, model D2, 3J and 5J. At the assembled length, you're looking at 4,600 to 5,400 pounds of pressure that are being contained in these at all times. And the problem with that is 
these center bolts have been known to break. So with these track frames sitting on the floor like they are now, with no tracks on them, if one of those bolts were to break, it has sufficient force to push the idler clear off the end of the track frame and most likely through that door before it stops moving. I was talking with an old fellow one time, used to work at a dealer on these back in the day, and he even talked about a D8 they were working on, had the track off of it. I don't know if they were working on the recoil spring or not, but the bolt broke and he told me that that idler shot off the front of the track frame. Luckily, nobody was in front of it, but it actually went about 20 feet skidding across the shop floor out the already over, open overhead door and then rolled another few feet into the parking lot out front before it finally stopped moving. And you consider a D8 idler is probably close to being on par with the weight of one of those entire assembled D2 track frame assemblies. So, you know, they can be dangerous. You look at the chart here, you get down to like the D8, the 1H and 8Rs is as far forward as it goes, but you've got up to 14,000 pounds on one of the springs. It looks like we have a double spring set up. The other one's up to 6,100 too. So yeah, that's that's a lot of a lot of tension. If that center bolt was to break with the track on, what that does is, well, pretty much takes over for your adjustment bolt for your track tension. So if that thing cracks, you know, inside the spring back here, you have the full force of that spring exerting pressure on the track. You can't slack the track. The manual procedure for dealing with that is something that I don't think I would really do, but I'll just show you. It's kind of a poor picture, but what they do, they take a chain and wrap it several times, well, through the sprocket spoke and then through the idler. And then what they would do is put the tractor in reverse back up so that the sprocket spoke actually pulls on the chain, pulls the idler back, slacks the track. You then remove the master pen, loop the track off, and then drive the tractor forward until you've released the pressure on the spring. Then you can deal with the bolt. You only have to compress these about two inches. This is about a 19 inch spring uncompressed. And like I said, 17 and a 16th is all the farther you need to go. You've already built up to 5,000 pounds of pressure because these are quite stout springs. In my world, these springs rarely ever break. I've seen broken bolts. I've never personally seen a broken spring. It's not that hard to find more springs. I would take a cutting torch to sacrifice the spring before I would chain up and try to pull the idler with the sprocket and then have all that loaded tension when you're working out front of this thing, splitting the track and looping it off if something was to let go. You take a torch here and just start cutting one coil at a time. You don't have to cut many coils before the spring is so short. It's not exerting tension on anything anymore and then you can safely take it apart. Now, an interesting thing did happen when I was taking this recoil spring assembly apart the other day. Well, I had backed the nut off. We started running it off the end of the bolt here. And this plate on the end was actually rusted in place on the bolt. You can see where those threads are so full of rust right there. It was rusted so tight that I had backed the nut off probably a good inch or so. That plate was still in position holding the entire compressed um, tension of this spring just with that rust bond. And for just a second, the little devil on my shoulder says, hey, let's run this thing the rest of the way off, stand back and hit that with a hammer and see how far we can get things to fly. Then I reminded myself that I am an idiot. And if I would be working four or five inches out in front of that thing with only about two threads left on the nut before it comes off, and that plate decided to loosen up and everything started flying, I would probably delete this appendage before I even knew anything happened. So I left it right where it was, went and got the camera and we're not even getting our finger close to this. I've backed the nut off, but the plate is rusted to the large center bolt yet and it's retaining all that spring tension all by itself, just that rust bond. Let's see if we can't loosen that up. Listen to that spring. <laughs> so we're probably getting a little long-winded on this by this point, but it was something I thought was worth mentioning because these machines will chew you up and spit you back out again if you let them. Just something to be mindful of when you're working on these undercarriages. Basically, don't get in front of that idler if you don't have to. And when you're dealing with that spring, just realize you are basically handling a bomb. Other than that, it's pretty fun. So let's start taking something apart. 
Okay, we'll begin by removing both of the idler yoke arms. And just a warning, you're probably going to see me using an impact wrench on undercarriage more than anything else, and I'm kind of in a hurry tonight anyway. Even though I use these things all day at the real job and I just hate listening to them, well, sorry guys. Pop the front bolts out next, and yep, that one's free. And number two. And of course, performed all the same steps for the other side. We'll be doing a lot of that. So, before we can slide the idlers off the track frames, we need to loosen these two bolts and those two bolts. They exert pressure on springs that are inside these kind of round housings here. Those springs exert pressure upon this shoe, and that shoe with some brackets and wear plates back here exerts pressure upon the top of the frame channel keeps that idler from flopping all over so we'll back these four bolts out that should kind of loosen this well hopefully we have a lot of rust that we're fighting but that's going to give us the easiest time possible in loosening it up enough to get that idler slid off the front of the frame <laughs> see that bolt kind of has a pusher end on it Come on. I think the camera knows that we shouldn't have impact wrenches out on this channel. <laughs> yeah, this one's not sliding off too bad. Tell you what, so far those idler bearings feel pretty good and tight. Of course, old grease. And while we're at it, we might as well thread the adjuster nuts off. Now that's unprecedented, by hand. There's old grease under there. And where the yoke goes, it's just clean. It shouldn't even be. I've never taken a D2 apart that's been this nice. Love seeing that old grease. Now we can begin taking the recoil springs off. And the first thing you want to do is remove the four bolts for this guide that goes around the front of the spring. Okay, with the guides loose at the front of each recoil assembly, we just have this bolt and nut at the back on each side to take out and the whole spring can be lifted from the frame. But first, considering this is an early first generation frame, these bolts are gonna be a lot easier to get to back here than a later tractor. And it all has to do with the position of this tube. This tube goes around the pivot shaft and if you sight down the top of this early frame rail, you can see it's pretty much even with the center line of that tube. Later tractors, they actually raised that tube so it was about two thirds above the top of the frame. They also added an extra spacer block underneath that mainspring perch. What that did was raise the whole tractor an additional half to three quarters of an inch. That made the bottom rollers the lowest part of the undercarriage system and it lifted the drive sprocket up off the ground somewhat. That was to keep excessive shock loads out of that final drive and it helped those final drives to last well, quite a bit longer. Then you get into later U-series tractors and they redesigned the main spring and actually cut that perch down in, but that's a horse of a different color. We don't have to worry about that today.
flip the frames. Okay, just don't mind me. This is something I kind of had to do, you know, bother me. Oh man, look at all of that old grease. Look at all of that stuff. Yeah, they were just shooting those things full. Same on this side. Lots of scraping to do. I'll tell you what. Oh, I told you this undercarriage work is just the dirtiest of all. You know, we can see some wear on the faces of those shells. Tell you what though. They're not bad. I can't make them click. Of course, if I scrape all the old grease out, that one's got a little bit of in place starting. That one's got a little more. Not a lot for bearing wire though. Can't imagine there would be with that much grease in it. Um, Here, tell you what, we do need to check something here first. I can tell by the clock on the wall and it's, you know, kind of dark 30 outside. We're just about at the end of another video here, just giving you guys advance warning. Just check these springs. It's like we're solid 17 on that one. Coils look good, bolt looks like brand new. I don't see any reason to take that one apart. Same for this one. Coils look good, bolt is in excellent shape. We're like 17 and eighth on there, I'll allow it. 17 and 1 16 is spec. So I don't think we're gonna have to worry about recoil springs. I think we can just get by with all that as is. So we'll cut it for now, pick up again tomorrow, even though all I want to do is start ripping bolts out of rollers right now. Ugh. Looks like we're arranged single flange, double, double, single. You have to have a single on the back so it clears the sprocket, but I kind of like a double on the front. But that, hey, okay, we're getting a little bit off track. Getting ahead of ourselves. Maybe we'll cover that next time. Maybe the time after, who knows. But undercarriage is halfway apart already. We haven't broken any bolts. I shouldn't have even said that out loud. Hopefully we don't get burned on that next time. See you back everybody.